today we are going to begin our serial sermon series. It's going to be a short sermon series uh, through the season of Lent. I know on uh, Palm Sunday we'll have the cantata, uh, so we're looking at maybe maybe three Sundays, uh, which will be plenty. I'll try to try to put as much uh, stuff in there as I can. But we're going to begin the serial sermon series today. And as we move through this series, I really want you to meditate upon one thing. I want you to think about it. I want you to pray on it. And uh, this one thing I want you to meditate on is what can a box of syrup teach me about my relationship with God? What can a box of cereal teach me about God and my relationship with Him? And then that way, anytime you go to the store, you open the cabinet, anytime you see a box of cereal, my hope is that a seed will be planted and you'll immediately thank God. Thank God. Because cereal is all around us. It's everywhere. I read a statistic that said cereal is in 92% of our homes. That it made up almost 8 billion, I think I even have a slide, I'm probably jumping ahead of myself. There it is. Uh, 815 pounds of sugar per year is used in cereal. In 2017, it brought in almost $8 billion in revenue. Uh, the origin, I didn't know this, the origin of cereal can be traced all the way back to the Civil War. It's an invention or it was innovated here in America, from what I've read. And it was actually, uh, people argue that it was uh, invented here in the Midwest, uh, North Midwest. Uh, so uh, cereal began here in our area. But, uh, you know, I remember as a kid watching those cereal commercials on Saturday mornings, or back when cartoons were only on Saturday mornings from like 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. They would just bombard you with these cereal commercials. As a kid, they would throw these colorful characters out there, these colorful boxes. Aside from all that sugar that was used in the cereal, what appealed to me the most, and I'm sure appealed to most kids and even some adults, is of course the toy that was in the cereal box. Kellogg's launched the toy revolution in an attempt to entice people to purchase their product. And I didn't care, I didn't care what the cereal was. I wanted the toy. I wanted what was on the package. And if I went to the store and I saw there's the cereal that had that toy on it, that was my favorite cereal. Whether it was spinach flavored, Brussels sprout flavored, I didn't care. It was about the toy. And there were four ways that you could get toys. They did it in four different ways. There was the in-store. Some of you may remember. I don't remember this. But there was the in-store gift where you would purchase the product and as you checked out, you received the toy or the prize that went with that product at the store. It was the in-store gift. There was the impact gift, which is the most popular. That's the one I remember the most. And that's where the toy was put in to the cereal. That's when your kids would dump everything out or stick their hands in there and try to find that toy. Then there was the one where it's called on pack and that's when it was attached to the cereal box itself. And I remember uh, some cereal boxes came with, remember those, they had plastic records? Uh, they could be square, they could be round, they were attached to the box or you could find uh, cereals with the board games on the box. You would cut them out, you would play these games or trading cards, baseball cards. But then there was also the mail-in toy. If you mailed in so many proofs of purchase, you would receive the gift, the prize, back in the mail. Somewhere between two weeks and two years, you would get, and I remember one of, and I had one of these, and I wish I still had it, one, and it had been movie tie-ins and stuff, so one of the giveaways was um, a, an, an Obi-Wan Kenobi ghost figure. If you're familiar with Star Wars and Empire and then Jedi, he appeared as the ghost figure. And so they came out all blue. And because it was a mail-in, it was one of the rare figures. And I used to own one of them, and I don't know whatever happened to it, but you could mail your thing in, you could get those things back. The cereal, it's all around us. Tons of it. They have special cereals that come out for special seasons. They have, uh, you know, Wheaties sometimes has those athletes on there. <laughs> they have cereals. Um, I wish I would have printed out some of the cereals that, you know, E.T., they had a cereal, E.T., Mr. T., you remember Mr. T. cereal? All around us. It's in our homes. It's in our cabinets. It's in our schools. It's on the menus at the restaurants. All around us. And it comes mostly in boxes. You can find them in bags. 
But the cereals that we're familiar with the most come in boxes. These are the small versions. We give these out to the uh, kids when we pack our weekend lunch boxes or bags. We'll sometimes throw a box of cereal in there for them to have a breakfast item. And it's just a simple way <coughs> to feed them and it's a simple way to uh, organize cereals. And so as I begin to think about the cereal sermon, as I begin to look, you know, we had some of these cereal boxes over here the past few weeks. I told you a couple weeks ago I was working on this series. I began to look. I actually had some of the cereal sitting on my desk all week just looking at it, thinking about it. And I began to ask myself, you know, what is it that a cereal box, what is it that cereal can teach us about God? And the more I thought about it, the more I prayed about it, the more excited I became. Because really there's a lot that we can learn from a simple box of cereal. One, it's in a box. Boxes. We like boxes. I was looking at more statistics and about how popular, and this isn't even something I would even think about, but boxes are on the list of the most popular things for people. We love boxes. We love to organize things in boxes. When we move, we use boxes. We put things in the boxes. We label those boxes. We eat box lunches. We ship things in boxes. We receive things in the mail in boxes. I know every day I drive by our house after the mail supposedly has come, if it's still out there, and I'm always looking for, we're always looking for boxes sitting by our front door. When we see a box, we get excited. More times than not, Cassie does, because she orders more things. She spends more money than I do. There'll be six boxes sitting there, and, and oh, that's my oil, and that's my this. Huh? Mine comes in tubes. Yes, I have tubes. Posters wrapped in tubes. Yes. But boxes. We get excited about it. We wrap presents in boxes. We've been in restaurants and they jack in the box. Names, uh, boxes. Boxes, you know, in some way, I think the reason why we like boxes is because in some way, boxes give us a sense of organization. They give us a sense of uh, control. We can control what we put in boxes. We control what labels we put on. We are naming those boxes. We put file folders in boxes and we name those folders. It gives us a sense of, of power, a sense of control. It's kind of like Adam who named the animals. This file is going to be called this. This box will be labeled this. We're going to put these boxes over here. This box is going to go over here. I'm going to know where things are. I am in charge. It gives us that sense of organization. We are in control of what goes in the box, of what comes out of that box, when it comes out of that box. Power. We still got boxes in our basement from when we moved into that house that are still not open. Those are boxes that we have put aside as unimportant. We will control when those boxes get brought up. It's natural for us to be, to want to be in control. It's natural for us we want to have that sense of power. Even when it comes to God. We like the idea of being able to wind that little handle. You know that song? Goes the weasel. We like to control when God comes out of that. We like to turn that handle and we'll let him out when we're ready to let him out. We create boxes in our minds. We create boxes of what God can and cannot do. We create boxes. We put God in those boxes. In the areas of our lives where we don't want God to be involved, that we don't want God telling us how to live, or we don't want God interfering, we take those boxes up with duct tape and we put them in the basement. Those other areas of our lives where it's okay for God to make an appearance, we will move them up and we will loosen that tape. It's okay. We want to control. We want to tell God when he can and when he cannot interfere. I think of that story and going off script a lot this morning. I'm sorry. We don't have choir, so I'm just going to keep over here. It reminds me of the incident in the scriptures 
Wayne, of course, now I've lost my train of thought. We know I go off script and I just lost my train of thought there. But control, when he comes out, when he doesn't come out, all of that, we want to be in control. Power. So what happens is, we end up worshiping our own image of who God is, rather than worshiping the God who created us in His image. When we decide where God is going to work in our lives, when we decide how God is going to work in our lives. We are creating God in our image. That's not the way it works. Imagine what could happen if we would allow God out of the boxes of our lives. Imagine if we were to open all of the boxes in our basement, in our living areas, in our attics, if we just opened them all up and said, God, we want all of you to come out. We want all of you to touch every aspect of our lives. Imagine what could happen. When we do this, transformative things happen in our relationship with Him. First, we question our assumptions. We question our embedded theologies. And I've talked about embedded theologies before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But let's turn to the book of Acts, chapter 10, this morning. Acts chapter 10, we're going to start with verse 9. This is a lengthy story. This is when uh, Cornelius, who is a Roman centurion, he, he calls for Peter. He has a vision. God speaks to him. He calls for Peter. Peter's having a vision of his own. God is telling him to go to the home of Cornelius. And I want to pick up in verse 9. We're going to read a couple of verses here. In verse 9, about noon... The following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry. He wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill, and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Now for me, this is what Lent is all about. We are in the season of Lent. This captures what the season of Lent is about. It's looking at my relationship with Christ. It's looking at my relationship with God and discarding the untrue and embracing the things that God says is true. Embedded theology. Embedded theology is the theology that we have been taught. It's the theology that we have heard. It's the theology that we have embraced, but we've never stopped to ask ourselves why. Why do we believe what we believe? Why do we believe it? because that's what my grandpa told me. But, but what does God say about it? Peter was a devout Jew. Peter, even though he embraced Jesus as the Messiah, continued to live his life according to the traditions of Judaism, which meant that he continued to eat the clean animals and discard the unclean. He continued to live in Jewish ways. He prayed. At Jewish times, he was going to the roof at noon to pray. When I say beam me up, Scotty, what do you think? Beam me up, Scotty, what do you think? Star, Star Trek. Trek. Not wars, Star Trek. But did you know that beam me up, Scotty, is a phrase that was never, ever, 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 ever used in any of the episodes of Star Trek? 
Now, variations of it have been used, but nowhere at any time does Kirk ever go, boop, beam me up, Scotty. Never. Never in any of the movies was that phrase used. In the animated series, that phrase was never used. Yet it's a phrase that is synonymous with Star Trek. And there's even people that will argue with you to the blue to the, the blue and say, yes, that's that, that was that was a TV show. No. It wasn't. That's a loose example of embedded theology. But it's an example. It's something that we're taught that we accept, but we never ask why. We never ask, is it the truth? Peter was a Jew. He wouldn't eat unclean things, and God challenges that belief here. And it's not that Peter's necessarily anything bad. He's doing what he's been taught. He's doing what he has believed. But as a disciple, as one who learns and grows, he's got to be willing to move in new directions in order to accomplish the purpose of God the mission of God. Naturally, Peter says, no way. No way. This is, this is what the law says. This is what we've been taught. This is what for generations, Lord. This is how we've always done it. That's something we hear in the church a lot. That's how we've always done it. But we're not here to live for ourselves. We are here to live for God. And that means moving out of our comfort zone. Transformation. To move out of our comfort zone is to put ourselves in a vulnerable position. It is a position of humility. It's a position of service. When I left my good job at the school system, working with those uh, the mentally handicapped kids and the, and the physically handicapped kids, teaching them job skills, to attend seminary, that was scary. I was going to be surrounded by people from all over the country, people from all over the world, people who had been to Bible colleges, people who had read the scriptures from front to cut, front to, to back, hundreds of times, people who grew up in church homes, people who knew more about ecclesiastical eschatology than I knew about. These were going to be people that were just going to make me feel, and they were going to intimidate me. I felt vulnerable. I felt out of place. I felt scared. But that's what moving out of your comfort zone does. That's what God challenging you does. He moves you from A to B to C to D. That's how you grow. That's how you mature. And I was mature enough to know that growing with God meant I had to step out with God. I was mature enough to know that if I stayed in the boat with the disciples, I wouldn't move. But that I needed to step out onto the water with Christ. So no offense, but I'd rather be out on the water than with you disciples. I'd rather be with Christ, learning and growing and trusting. Acts chapter 11, verse 1 and 3. 1 through 3. Peter returns and he explains his actions. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of an uncircumcised man and you ate with them? Peter put himself in a vulnerable position by going to Cornelius' house. And no, Luke refers to these people who are criticizing as circumcised believers. He wants us to, to make sure that we know that this group of people were hardcore traditional. And no, they're not even concerned that God's working. They don't even care that God is doing a marvelous thing over here. They're more concerned that Peter ate with him. They're more concerned that Peter went into Cornelius' house. It doesn't matter what God's doing. In my opinion, that's one of the worst things Christians are guilty of today. We are so quick to criticize others for not being like us that we miss how God may be working through them. We're so busy thinking about how crazy, about how wild, about how quiet, how unorganized, how unreliable, how this, this, and this, and this, that when God's doing wonderful, marvelous things, we're blinded. God was beginning to move in a new direction with Peter. He continues to move in that direction with Paul. He's continuing to move in that direction with us. But unless we're willing to let God out of the boxes of our lives, to let go of assumptions, 
To let go of embedded theologies in the sense that we sit down and have serious reflection on why I believe what I believe. Unless we're willing to step out of those comfort zones, we're going to miss where God is working. Amen. We work hard at keeping God in a box. This is what the law did. The law kept God in a box. The law gave the Pharisees power. The law gave the Pharisees control. The law gave the Pharisees authority, and they used it to their advantage. Paul tells us that the very law that was intended to bring life actually brought death, because no one could keep it. No one could keep the law. No matter how much we think we know, no matter how much power we think we have, no matter how much we think we can do on our own, it comes down to one thing. Trusting and obeying. Letting God out of that box and trusting Him with every aspect of our lives. And then obeying God when He calls on us to move with Him. Listening for Him. Trusting in Him. He's not going to let you fall. It can be scary. But it can also be very rewarding. I'm evidence of that. I've said it before, I can imagine where I'd be today had I not stepped out and trusted him on that water. So I invite you to reflect on those words this morning. As we turn to our closing hymn, Trust and Obey, number 469, same verse 1, Trust and Obey. Two words that go together, two words that are crucial when it comes to our relationship with God. Trust and obey. So let's stand together. Let's close out our time. 469. We'll sing verse 